The Washington Commanders current roster of 90 players will eventually turn into 53. And I'm going to tell you one name at every position that is already coming into OTAs and mandatory minicamp on the bubble. That and more on today's mailbag episode of Locked On Commanders. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into this Tuesday episode of Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. And you can continue the conversation over on subtext at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders, where you can go one on one with me because I am your host, David Harrison. D Harrison 82 on Twitter, credential member of the media covering the Washington Commanders as a beat reporter for Commander Country, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site covering your Washington Commanders. Here with you every Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. And as always, I appreciate all of you, and especially the everydayers, for your continued support of the show. On today's episode of Locked On Commanders, we're going to discuss Eric Bieniemy running backs from the past in his coaching history and how they translate to the current stable of backs on Washington's roster. And we're going to discuss some rebranding ideas. But first, we're going to open up the mailbag with a question from a lot of you. More than a few of you have been asking me in different forms and different ways about which players on the Washington Commanders roster right now are at biggest risk for getting cut once this 90-man roster has to get trimmed down. Uh, to 53. And granted, we are a little bit away from that time period coming up, but I've had enough of you ask the question that I feel like this is worth diving into now, and we can always go back to it uh, at a later time. Now, uh, the question has some layers to it, right? So to really get kind of an accurate prediction projection from me, uh, I would also have to go through and predict how many players I think are going to be on the initial 53-man roster to start the season at each position. So obviously there's going to be 53 people, right? But the question is, what is the distribution uh, of positions going to be? How many quarterbacks are there going to be? How many running backs, et cetera, et cetera. For that, answer, for that answer, I don't have that answer right now. I haven't seen enough practices. I haven't seen enough training camps. I can't look at this team through a uh, rookie mini camp and one OTA practice. I'll get my second OTA practice this week. But I can't look at this team yet and say, aha, Eric Bieniemy is going to use a lot of these players. I can kind of look at Jack Del Rio's defense, and I have a pretty strong feel uh, for that already. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But Eric Bieniemy's offense is really kind of the big part of that thing because we know that head coach Ron Rivera is going to let is is not going to let he's letting Eric Bieniemy have a lot of say so in how this team is operating, how the offense is operating, and so that say so is going to bleed over. Uh, to the roster construction. So for right now, to answer this question a little bit early, right? But it's it's never too too early to talk about kind of how this team looks going into their training and preparation, right? Uh, I'm going off of last year's numbers. So this isn't necessarily a prediction of how many players from each position will be on the initial 53-man roster, but it is just a reflection of what the Washington Commanders did last year uh, I look back, uh, you know, through Ron Rivera's time with the franchise, and the numbers are fairly similar. I think last, not last year, but 2021, uh, I think the team went with three running backs. They went with four last year. So there's some small differences here. We'll talk about some of those, and we'll talk about some areas that I kind of already anticipate there might be a shift uh, in the total numbers. But looking at this question, who's on the bubble as we come into OTAs and get ready for training camp? Uh, I went through and, and like I said, I used last year's 53 man initial 53 man roster numbers and the Washington Commanders last year kept three quarterbacks, four running backs, six wide receivers, five tight ends, nine offensive linemen on the offense. They kept five defensive ends, four defensive tackles, five linebackers, four cornerbacks, five safeties. And then, of course, three special teamers, the kicker, the punter, uh, the long snapper, who's, uh, you know, th those are the special teams guys. So. That was the breakdown in the distribution of the roster last year. So I kept with those numbers. And with those numbers in mind, looking at the Washington Commanders roster, looking at some of the early snaps going on, here are the players that I think are going to enter training camp, I guess, on the bubble, right? Uh, and again, for on the bubble, I'm talking about guys who are either going to be the last guy on the initial 53-man roster or the first guy headed to, you know, 
practice squads if they clear waivers uh, and all those things. And we'll talk more about clearing waivers and getting added to the practice squad as we get closer to that time. So kind of a March Madness style deal here, right? Where you talk about maybe the first team in or the last team into the, to the, to the tournament or the first team out of the tournament. So when I look at quarterbacks, uh, this team kept three last year, the third quarterback. So if they keep three, that would be the last guy on the roster. I think that guy is quarterback Jake Fromm. Uh, he's at Georgia lineage. He was here last year on the practice squad. He's got some experience and looking at the early reps, uh, especially during OTAs. He looks like the number three quarterback. Uh, Jake's a good dude. He's a smart dude. Uh, he, he knows Sam. He knows how to support him. He knows how to be. He's been in this room. He's been again. He's been in the locker room. So I feel like Jake Fromm has to have the early kind of upper hand on that third spot. Now, if they only keep two, then Jake Fromm would be that quarterback. It would be Sam Houch, Cobra Brissett. So that's where I think Jake Fromm is, again, either the last quarterback on the active initial 53-man roster or the first quarterback off of it headed to practice squad. So hopefully that gives you a, a beat of kind of how we're doing this. Chris Rodriguez Jr., uh, the rookie running back, is my on-the-bubble running back for the Washington Commanders right now. And this one's a little bit tricky because last year they kept four running backs on the initial 53-man roster. This year, if they keep three running backs, you're looking at Brian Robinson Jr., Antonio Gibson. And I think a lot of people would put Chris Rodriguez Jr. there in that third spot. Right now, for me, I'm putting Jonathan Williams in that third spot. Now, we've got a Chris Rodriguez Jr. film study episode coming up on Wednesday. So we'll talk more about Chris. And this is not a slight towards Chris. This isn't me saying that I've seen you know nothing good from rookie camp or OTAs towards Chris. It's just Jonathan Williams is a veteran. And I think Chris is going to have to come in and kind of earn that third spot if that's where he's going to sit. So for right now, uh, again, I put Chris Rodriguez as that bubble player, either the fourth running back on the initial 53 or the first running back off of it if they're only going with three. Wide receivers. Last year, the Washington Warriors went with six of these bad boys. I'm putting Dax Milne on that bubble. And I think a lot of you know that Casimir Allen is the guy that you should probably look out for the most to challenge him for his spot on the roster tight ends. The Washington Commanders kept five last year. I think obviously Armani Rogers would kind of have the inside track on having that fifth tight end spot uh, locked up. But with his injury, that opens the door for a guy like Curtis Hodges in his second year out of Arizona state. So again, if they keep five, I think Curtis Hodges is that guy, but if they only go with four, Curtis Hodges, probably the first guy headed to the practice squad. Offensive lineman. Last year we had nine. I think Braden Daniels is the tackle, is the offensive lineman, interior lineman, wherever he ends up playing. Uh, that is going to be the guy that's kind of on the bubble. Uh, Chris Paul is expected to kind of step up in the secondary role. There's been some veteran additions. That's that's a tough group uh, to crack these days. So I think Braden Daniels, if there's nine, he's probably the last one. Honestly, I can't see there being eight. So I feel like Braden Daniels' spot is fairly secure. Defensive ends last year, the Washington Commanders went with five of them. I think William Bradley King is the fifth one as of right now. Defensive tackles, they went with four. Abdullah Anderson, honestly, Abdullah, I think you're keeping at least four defensive tackles. So really, this is kind of like the fifth guy. I think Abdullah Anderson uh, is the guy on the outside looking in if they go with four. Again, linebackers, Washington kept five last year. Dijon Harris is the, is the, is the guy uh, on the outside looking in. In that situation, four cornerbacks, Rashad Wild Goose, I think, uh, is the guy that's going to be fighting for that last spot or the first guy to head to the practice squad. And then they kept five safeties last year. I think Farad Gardner uh, is that sixth safety who's trying to battle his way to that fifth spot. I don't know how easy it's going to be to crack that. So that's kind of my early list of on-the-bubble players for the Washington Commanders. Now, there's a couple of notes here with Curtis Samuel and Casimir Allen kind of capable of doing some things out of the backfield potentially. Uh, I do want to do some studying on Casimir Allen right now. That's more just of a traits translation, for my opinion. There may not be four running backs this year. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a little bit. So that could make that battle for the final spot if it's only three, like I said, between Rodriguez uh, and Jonathan Williams. The extra roster spot freed up from a running back could be used on another offensive lineman. Given the turnover that this team had on offensive line last year, adding a 10th offensive lineman certainly could make sense. And I think that opens the door for a guy like Trent Scott uh, to stay on the active roster, a swing tackle from the Pittsburgh Steelers last year who signed this offseason. Uh, could also see the commanders trim a linebacker spot, putting Milo Eifler uh, on the bubble. Linebackers, you know, minimizing Jack Del Rio's defense, but they're still pretty valuable to special teams. So it's going to be interesting to see how they balance out those two needs. Uh, you may also add another defensive tackle. Maybe Abdul Anderson comes in and, and joins the group on the active roster, joining Jonathan Allen, Duran Payne, John Ridgway, and Federia Mathis. 
and that could open the door to more five-man fronts this year. I think that you could see more five-man fronts this year from the Washington defense. Uh, and some of this is just semantics. If you call Quan Martin a corner, then maybe you have five corners and four safeties. If you call him a safety, five safeties, four corners. Uh, but look, but either way, this could push cornerback Christian Holmes to the practice squad, uh, which would be a relative step back because he did play in 17 games as a rookie. It's a little early again, like I said, to have, be having bubble conversations. But like I said, enough people have asked about this. So those are the guys that right now I kind of view as their guys who are fighting for their jobs, either fighting to stay on the roster or fighting to move up the roster to secure one of those last spots. Of course, I'll keep an eye on these guys, all of these guys, and we'll we'll revisit this again as training camp gets closer and as we get to the end of training camp. But great question from many of you. So hopefully uh, I answered that question well for all of you. Some of you asked it in kind of differing ways. Some of you asked about specific players that I kind of focused in on here uh, for you specifically. But that I think that covers basically the basis of players that may or may not be uh, in jeopardy of losing their jobs or gaining jobs potentially uh, through training camp this season. Next up, we're going to have a branding conversation because that's uh, a, a conversation that is still ongoing and will be ongoing for quite some time. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're going to have that conversation thanks to our friends over at Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious snack, but you don't want all the sugar and the calories, then you need the best tasting protein bar ever. Built, you got to try this. Built Bars are healthy and they taste amazing. They taste so amazing, you're not going to realize that they're good for you. They all, they're all covered in 100% real chocolate and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. These bars taste like candy bars, but they contain Amazing macros, only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, but they pack 17 grams of protein. You can get them at your local Walmart or your local Sam's Club, or you can have them delivered straight to your door via built.com. If you head to Walmart, you can get a four bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or the coconut puff. And if you go to Sam's Club, you can get a 13 bar box of hit flavors like brownie batter puff and churro puff. And of course, you can go to built.com to check out the return of coconut brownie chunk. Puff. No matter how you get it, no matter how you try it, Built Bar, you got to try this. Continuing on with today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Thanks again for making Locked On Commanders your first listen or your first, first view today and everyday mailbag episode. If you want to drop your questions in for a future mailbag episode, please do so here in the YouTube comments. Or if you're listening on audio, hit me up on Twitter at dharrison82 or send your question in to LockedOnCommanders at gmail.com. Or, of course, you can join the conversation at subtext. Join subtext.com slash LockedOnCommanders. Several ways uh, for you to get in touch with me. Every day, make sure you come back tomorrow. We will be talking about Chris Rodriguez, the rookie running back out of Kentucky for the Washington Commanders, doing our film study on Chris. Uh, we're diving into four games of the new Commanders running back this time because he's the only one that we have to study. So we're going to get four games in. On Chris, we'll do one in the first segment, two in the second, and the final game in the third segment. And then I'll tell you where I foresee him uh, stacking up in this depth chart at the end of training camp. Now, getting back to our mailbag, though, we have uh, a question, topic of conversation, I guess is a better way to put it, from Trevor, who says this. And, and he wrote a lot. So, Trevor, I greatly appreciate you. I think Trevor is one of my subtexters. I uh, greatly appreciate all the subtexters, especially the ones who are, are consistently communicating uh, he writes, basically, there's a bunch of discussions about rebranding again. Local media seems to lean toward the opinion that it's too many name changes in too short a time. Basically, their argument is fatigue. I don't share their opinion for a variety of complex reasons. Trevor says he's a local kid and grew up participating in something he compares to kind of like Cub Scouts that has a name that we can't repeat on this show uh, in this day and age. But it was designed to show respect towards Native Americans, not show any type of negativity. If it's the same program I'm thinking of, it's now called Adventure Guides. Uh, the movie The Last of the Mohicans came out when Trevor was eight. So, Trevor, you're a little younger than I am based on that dating. Uh, the fight song for his favorite football team, you all know it used to begin with Hail 2, uh, which is a sign of respect. Finally, Trevor says he was a tough kid. Toughness was a value held very highly in his home. His father used to tell he and his brother spit on it. That's a quote from Trevor spit on it. If you got nicked up, uh, go back and play. And that is what they did. Trevor supported all the local teams, but he's a football guy first. And with the Redskins, he thought the team had a fierce name, something that brought an image of toughness and of native American warriors, other team names like the capitals and the nationals 
Uh, I'll go ahead and throw the Wizards in there. Those aren't tough, but the football team name was. Trevor isn't advocating for the return of the team name, but he hates commanders. He says it sounds like military middle management. It's not fierce. Uh, Trevor says, I'm not advocating for the return of the original name, but I absolutely hate the commander's name. Uh, It sounds like military middle management. Not at all a fierce name. Um, I agree, first of all. Uh, so it's interesting as the, as the renaming was coming up, I did a lot of radio. Um, and I, you know, I think partially because of my military background, people wanted my opinion and I was willing to share it. And, and yeah, look, I've had really good commanders in my, in my first career. Um, some that I would go to war with, you know, any day, any day of the week if I needed to, but, and, and this isn't the truth for every commander, right? Like every branch and every service and every job is a little bit different, right? So I think we it's important when we're talking about real people that we stay away from too many blanket statements. But generally speaking, in the majority of commanders in military talk, they're not people of action. They're more people of direction. You know what I mean? Um, so it's just uh, it's just fine. One of the jokes I made was that you wouldn't have a bunch of commanders on a battlefield engaging in, in, in hand-to-hand combat, so to speak. You would have a bunch of commanders telling other people to go engage in that hand-to-hand combat. And that's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I think it kind of speaks to what Trevor uh, is speaking of here. Now, basically, the conversation Trevor wants to have is about the rebranding of the team, assuming that Goodell and the NFL would allow a waiver to, to change the name ahead of schedule because Trevor understands, uh, and I hope all of you understand, if not, there are rules in the national football league for how often you can change a team name. And I think it's five years if I remember off the top of my head. Um, So once you change a a team name, you can't change it for another five years. So a couple of things in this conversation. First, I appreciate the message from you, Trevor. It was a very long message. I'm paraphrasing here just so everybody knows. Uh, So, so, you know, instead of reading it word for word, because it was very long, but I think I delivered kind of the spirit of it. And basically he, like many fans still do not like the name for a variety of reasons. Uh, most didn't like Washington football team at first, but then it kind of grew on them. And I think there's a resistance to the idea that commanders can now grow on the fan base because media mostly, right. We are pointing out that it almost feels like, you know, we, you didn't like Washington football team when it first came out and the entire league laughed at Washington football team when it first came out, but eventually people kind of loved it. People kind of rallied behind it. And I think that those, those of you commanders fans who still don't like the name commanders, and, and I'm not trying to put all of you in, in a bunch, right? That's not fair. But I think it's being when that thing, when that statement is being said, because I've said that on this show that I think that with winning and with, you know, some excitement that the name commanders can then become synonymous with that winning, with that excitement and start to kind of attach itself to commanders fans. I think that's being taken in almost like a dismissive way, right? Like, yeah, yeah, you know, you didn't like Washington football team before. You'll like this too. And then at least for me, I can't speak for everybody, right? But when I say to to any of you, hey, you know, I think if this team can win, I think if this team has success under the name Commanders, you'll learn to love it too. I hope that's not being taken as dismissive towards your true, you know, appeal towards the team because that's not my intention at all. I just generally, I generally do believe that, the team name, while yes, it's important, it's more important what the team name elicits. And the more winning that comes, the more that team name, that logo, that look, that feel will elicit that joy of, of winning, right? So, so I truly believe that. Now, if I'm wrong, that's that's perfectly fine. I just want everybody to understand that if you're one of the fans who still does not like the name Commanders, I'm not trying to be dismissive of your dislike of the team. I just truly believe that in, in a human nature standpoint. So let's get into this discussion, right? I think the first part of this discussion is whether or not the NFL could approve a waiver to rename the team. And the answer is yes, of course it could. It clearly did because while you're not supposed to be allowed to change a franchise's name within five years of another name change, name change, you also can't change an NFL team's name in less than a month yet. That's what this franchise did back in July of 2020. So really if if we're being honest, it's an issue of product overhead design and stock and worth. It's about money. Just this year, this offseason, Washington Commanders receiver Curtis Samuel had to buy out the league's stock of number 10 jerseys because he wanted to change his number to number four. It's about money. So don't get it twisted, guys. It really is all about the monies. And if the new owners want to make a change and the NFL thought it would gain more profit than it would cost in expense to change the logos, the gear, the, all that stuff, they would certainly entertain the idea. So yes, the NFL could absolutely approve it. But I would imagine the rest of the owners would have to be on board because there's not really an extenuating circumstance here. Unfortunately for fans, 
if product is selling, it, it's not going to matter if there's a large amount of social media fans that are unhappy. Again, it's about the money. And right now the product is flying off the shelves and people are still buying it. So, and the other part of this is legacy. All of these NFL owners are aware that someday their team may be in the hands of another family. If the if they set the precedence that simply buying a team gives you the right to change the team name, even if it had just changed, that threatens their legacy. Because now if you're the owner of the Tennessee Titans, you become very, very aware that someday down the road, your team could change hands to another owner. And just like that, the team that you built, essentially from a branding standpoint, could disappear. So I don't think that would get through the through 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 the ownership to be quite honest with you. The second part of this conversation is should the new owners even really consider a new name? And for that, I'm going to dive into a little bit more and we'll do that on the other side of this coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. <laughs> Wrapping up this mailbag episode, talking about some rebranding topics here on this episode of Locked On Commanders. I uh, appreciate everybody who submitted questions, continues to submit questions. Again, if you have your questions that you want to submit uh, for a future mailbag episode, drop them here in the comments on YouTube. If you're listening to this on audio, hit me up on Twitter at dharrison82 or email at lockedoncommanders uh, at gmail.com or anytime on subtext, join subtext.com slash lockedoncommanders. We're talking about this rebranding thing, right? And for one, so I kind of outlined, yes, the NFL could, right? The NFL makes their own rules. They can change their own rules. They could approve uh, an ahead of time, a waiver, whatever you want to call it, a rule change to allow the Washington Commanders franchise to be renamed again, despite the fact that it hasn't been five years yet. Now, I kind of outlined some reasons why I didn't think it would happen. One, the money, the overhaul, the cost of the overhaul, the, the lost equipment or lost gear uh, profits, all those things. Plus the other owners in the NFL, I don't think they would be on board with it because it threatens their legacy as well. If their team gets sold out from under their family, even after they pass, that team name could then just disappear in the blink of an eye. And I don't think they want to start that precedence uh, themselves. But there's another part of this, and that is should the new owners really even be super concerned about this? And this is where some of you are going to be mad at me because I'm going to say, no, not initially. They should not be concerned about this right off the bat. There's a lot of things happening here with the Washington Commanders purchase. And to me, focusing on a brand change right out the gate would be like buying a house that you know needs work. Maybe it needs new plumbing, electrical, whatever. And the first thing you do is you repaint it. To me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. First off, they need to talk about where the team is housed. And I'm not just talking about stadium conditions where every day, as you remember, we did an episode not too long ago, ESPN got their hands on a document where Josh Harris is basically outlining to prospective minority owners that, hey, there are some upgrades that need to be done, whether it's from fan engagement or just stability of uh, FedEx Stadium, stuff like that. But we're not just talking about stadium conditions at FedEx. We're also talking about geography. And really, those two things are kind of go hand in hand because you really want to figure out where the team is going to live. And then once you figure that part out, what is that new house uh, going to look like. And while that is all going on, so while you're trying to secure land, secure funding from state or commonwealth or or DC governments, and you're trying to approve blueprints and pass codes and do all these other things, the NFL has to have their say in it because if you want to host the Super Bowl, there's going to be certain things that they want you to do, all these things. While that's going on, this new ownership group also has to remember they just bought an organization that has not had a healthy work environment for the last decade plus. So having that healthy work environment is absolutely key. And that also, to me, comes before the branding of the team. And you either have to establish that healthy working environment or you keep the one that has been being built since Ron Rivera uh, arrived. And honestly, I would start there. I would do in the Army, we call it a command climate survey. Businesses have their own mechanisms that do the exact same thing, but basically gauge the feel of the direction and the value that the employees in the organization feel from the franchise, how each group feels employees are treated, valued, and go from there. And honestly, if a strong portion of this population of current commanders, uh, players, coaches, staff members feel like the organization is on a good path, I'd stick with it. You know what I mean? We've had this is kind of a separate side conversation about will Ron Rivera get fired? Will he not get fired? And what is the bottom floor? And I think that the bar is set very, very high, but I almost with everything that this new ownership group has to deal with, I would say if the players are happy, if the coaches are happy, if the staff is happy, let it ride, like let it roll and worry about the other more important stuff first. And let's see if Ron Rivera can put together 
uh, a winning product. So that's just that's just kind of my look at it. So you have to find a new home location, put forward the plans for it, and then let the goodwill keep flowing. Like those are your three top priorities if you're the new owner for this team. So if you make drastic organizational changes, you could take that step backward. And honestly, if you take a step backward from an organizational standpoint and from a winning standpoint, nobody's going to care what the new name or what the new logo uh, is going to look like. So if you, so that's just my opinion, right? And 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 we can disagree, and that's perfectly fine. But that's just how kind of how I see it. Now, after all that, at a minimum, then yes, we can start talking about a name change. If the new owners want to change the name, then to me, they need to do a true fan engagement process. If they're going to do a true fan engagement process, this isn't something that should be rushed. The amount of people that hated and still hate the commanders, uh, I'm sorry, but because of that, there's no way I believe that fan input was actually valued in this process, right? I don't think the fan value was was valued. Uh, fan input was valued in the decision to make the name the Washington Commanders. I go back to, honestly, my childhood, the naming of the Colorado Avalanche in the NHL back in the mid-90s. I was living in Colorado. I was a kid back then when they moved from Quebec to Denver. So I don't remember all of the details, but I do you know, I go back and, and, and I found information that this team was originally, the Colorado Avalanche was originally going to be called the Rocky Mountain Extreme because that's what the team's first owner wanted the team to be named. He, he felt that it matched kind of the times. And look, this is the time of Surge Soda and X Games. And you know what I mean? Like Hot Topic was just getting launched, like all these things. Like, so it makes sense, right? Rocky Mountain Extreme, you know, as, as weird as it sounds right now, it really did kind of fit the motif of the day. But when that leaked, when that name leaked, uh, I think it was the Denver Post that leaked it, people in Colorado hated it, like hated the name, called into radio stations across the state and just hated the name. So the team pivoted and they held what they called back a feedback forum where fans could essentially vote on eight options. Those options were the Black Bears, Rapids, Cougars, Outlaws, Renegades, Storm, Wranglers, or the Avalanche. And the fans voted for the Avalanche and mostly everyone. I'm sure some people hated it, right? But pretty much everyone that I know loved it. And, uh, you know, the winning that followed certainly helped uh, solidify it as well. Now, to me, that's where this whole name change process went wrong. Instead of giving the illusion of a choice that fans get to be a part of it, offer a menu of real possibilities and let the majority rule go from there. And, and let's say, you know, look, let's say the top choice is 36% fan vote and the owner's favorite choice got like 34% of the fan vote, you could still go with the second most popular choice, never reveal the numbers and just say, yeah, yeah, that was the majority, even though it's really the owner uh, was the swing vote because there would still be a fan atmosphere of enough fans that love that name to make people say, okay, it wasn't the name I chose, but I do see that other fans liked it. But I mean, nobody likes commanders. Like I like, it's very rare that you meet somebody who says that they love the name Commander. Some of them have said it's grown on them. Some of them have said they enjoy it. Some of them just like the left hand up song now. Like, and then so that has made a connection, but the true name commanders does not just appeal uh, to a lot of people. So I feel like that at this time, if, if the new ownership group wants to do this again, I prioritize those other things first, but if you want to present seven other options along with commanders, uh, I think commanders comes in bottom three, right? Like honestly, and if I'm the new owners, I'm not coming into the NFL asking for any special favors. I'm not asking for a waiver to rename this team after what this franchise has put the league through and the other owners through. Instead, I'm targeting 2032, not just for a rebrand, but for a stadium. 2032, celebrate 100 years of this franchise with a rebirth. And in the meantime, secure whatever you need, get whatever documents, get whatever hurdles cleared. You need to make eight actual possible team names a reality. If Red Wolves isn't possible, then don't put it on the list. Like the amount of times the commanders put Red Wolves in a slideshow or in a video or hinted at it just to tell everybody that it was never going to happen. To me, that, that was short-sighted. Don't put it on the list, but give fans eight choices that you can actually make happen. Then let it ride, man. Let the fans vote. And if you do that, not everybody's going to love the name. But there's going to be enough people that they truly go with the majority rule system. There's going to be enough fans that like the new name for the other fans to look around and say, okay, I believe that it was actually this fan base at least that, uh, that chose his name. And look, if you still don't like it, then you only have your fellow fans uh, to, to get mad on. So uh, look, that's, so that's going to wrap up this conversation. Uh, a lot of good questions. Um, I had another question that I wanted to get to on this episode from Keith about some running back usage. Keith, I will store that question. I will use it for the next mailbag. Sorry, I couldn't get to it 
here, but a lot of good questions coming in from Commanders fans. So I really appreciate all of you coming up tomorrow. Our final film study of the Washington Commanders 2023 NFL draft class. And while you're watching or listening to that, I will be out in Ashburn at OTA practice number two in front of the media. And I will come back Wednesday or Thursday and Friday, rather, with my thoughts from that practice as we evolve uh, looking at this 2023 Washington Commanders group. If you have more questions to add to another mailbag episode or comments, just drop them in the YouTube comments. Hit me up on Twitter. Email me at LockedOnCommanders at gmail.com or send them to me directly via subtext. As always, thank you so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day, every day, every day. Thank you for coming through on a consistent basis like you do. And remember, you can continue this conversation with me over at JoinSubtext.com slash LockedOnCommanders. Thank you so much for making me part of your day, part of your routine. And if you have anything else Washington Commanders related you want to know or you want to discuss, make sure you also follow me on Twitter at dharrison82. So we speak again. Please be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked on Commanders, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.